public location for participating in this meeting. Any interested members of the public can participate telephonically or via internet by utilizing the link or the dial-in information printed on this agenda. Instructions on how to meet to make a public meeting comment during the meeting. At points during the meeting, when the meeting chair requests public comment, members of the public participating in the live meeting, either via internet or telephone, shall indicate their desire to speak. You can indicate the if the participant via internet, please press the raise hand feature located within the Zoom's application screen. If connected via phone, please dial star nine. All public comments shall be addressed to the board of directors and limited to three minutes per speaker. The board of directors may choose to respond to the comments or request that staff to respond to the comp respond at the conclusion of the public comment period. All right. Um, so I'm going to call to order um, to start the meeting. And Tiffany, can we do a roll call? Of course. Board Vice President Weiserman. Here. Director oh, Case. Here. <laughs> Director Kilkenny. Here. Director Shea. Here. And I am recording an absence for board president Ruggieri. Yes. Okay, so with uh, Lisa's absence, um, I'd like to propose a amendment to the agenda before we vote to approve the agenda and adopt it. Um, we have on District Matters, um, number three, review of the Marin Woods CSD Board of Directors bylaws. And I think that this is something that all of us should be here for. And I think I know that Lisa definitely wanted to talk about this. So I'm going to say that I motion to adopt the agenda, but removing um, item E3 for next month's agenda. And is that okay with everybody? Okay, sure. and is there, do I need to do public comment regarding um, changing the agenda, Eric? Well, you should get a motion in a second. Okay, can I get a motion in a second, please? So well, you, moved. Yeah, there you go. Seconded. Okay, um, so we are going to adopt the agenda, but then um, could I get some public comment if we have any? Sure, one sec. You have no hands raised. No hands raised. Okay, so we will go on to the consent. You, you need a vote. Oh, I need a vote. Sorry. Go ahead, Tiffany. Board, Board Vice President Oysterman. Aye. Director Case. Aye. Director Kilkenny. Aye. Director Shea. Aye. Thank you. And I, I have elderberry tea here that I'll be drinking, trying to avoid the COVID surge that's occurring. Sorry. Um, okay. I told you random comments. All right, so let's um, talk about the consent calendar. Um, does anybody have any questions? Oh, I guess we need to approve the resolution 2022-07, uh, making findings and confirming the need to continue conducting remote meetings via teleconference of the Board of Directors, the Fire Commission and the Park and Recreation Commission. This is all part of the consent calendar. Okay, so we can do it all together, perfect. Cor correct. All right, I, re I remember that now. Um, does anybody have any- Motion to approve. Okay. Is there a second? I'll second that. Second, no. All right, um, before we vote, is there any questions from the public? Uh, comments, yeah, one second. Or comments, questions, thoughts. Hi, Stephen. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, it's a question regarding uh, the expense for Murray Building. Uh, I noticed it was another 156K uh, paid out, and I'm just wondering how much we have paid for our building and how much we have to go. That's a question. Okay, is there, do you have any other questions about it too? So then you will put them all in and then we'll answer it at the end. Well, it's, uh, okay. You have, you have I mean, that, that's, that's the real important, that's the real important one. Okay. Is there anything else? Well, let's see. I was I, I was expecting an answer. Okay. Please, okay. you know, I, so, I I'm gonna just I'm gonna just just break here for a second because um, 
I, I do want to have a respectful dialogue back and forth. I do not want to be shut down. Um, it, the, the park and rec uh, uh, member, the commissioner, whoever it was, uh, was extremely rude at that meeting. I don't expect a repeat of that this evening. And the way we can do this is just by being civil and, you know, basic, you know, kindergarten uh, manners that we learned in kindergarten, being respectful of one another. So um, I'm sorry, I don't have any more questions at this time. I'm really am interested in the status of the payments for uh, the building, however, and so detailed information on that would be most welcome. All right, thank you. Um, I have no idea what happened at the Parks and Rec Commission, so please uh, give me some grace here. And I just wanted to remind you that when we said, um, we're, we're gonna look for you to re re make all your requests for comments um, and your comments, sorry, and requests for questions. And then at the end of the three minutes, we will go ahead and answer what we can. So that's why I was asking what I asked. Um, Eric, is there an answer that we can give Steven? Um, I'm gonna have to look it up. It's not something I have immediately in front of me but it's ultimately he has come through uh pretty much completed the project so that brings you to a total of payments now at 1.103 and then he's got on retainer uh, or uh, the retention at 55 191 that is yet to be paid out and then that and will close all. out that will close out that contract correct and and that was all what we expected and um small things that we approved that needed to be approved when there was changes, correct? Correct. Okay, thank you so much. All right, uh, is there any other public comments or questions? Uh, there's no other hands raised. Okay, perfect. Um, does, and I guess we've, no other board members have any questions about the bills paid or the draft minutes? All right, so um, is there a motion to approve? A motion in a second, would you like to vote now? Yes, please. Board Vice President Weiserman. Aye. Yes. Director Case. Aye. Director Kilkenny. Aye. And Director Shea. Aye. Thank you. Um, and again, everybody, thank you for giving me some grace. I may have been at lots of board meetings, but apparently running them is always different. All right. So we are at D, the public comment. Um, so I'm just gonna read this real quick. Speakers are asked to address comments to the board and limit comments to three minutes. Speakers may comment only on non-agenda items within the subject matter jurisdiction of the district. The board may not take action on or consider, uh, may, sorry, the board may not take action on, consider or debate items not on the agenda except under narrow circumstances meeting uh, statutory tests. Response to comments on the non-agenda items will be limited to factual information or clarifying questions from staff or board at the conclusion of the public comment period. The president may refer the matter to staff or to future meeting agendas. And we're gonna let people ask all their questions. And then once they are done, we will answer them. So just to clarify. All right, any public raise hands? Yeah, one second. Yes, Stephen. You're doing fine, Savon. Um, so don't worry about about that. Um, so uh, you know, this spring uh, is another beautiful spring in Lucas Valley, um, and uh, it's a constant reminder of the rebirth, growth, and rebirth, and death uh, that occurs in nature. And I wanted to talk a little bit about um, the district because uh, I'm a little concerned that we for too long have taken the attitude that if we get just enough done, that's good enough. And in fact, um, as you see in nature, rust happens, death happens, erosion happens, stuff just happens. And if we are not doing a little bit more than just emptying trash cans and, you know, doing the typical um, 
uh, chores that we need to do every year, we're not doing enough. We're going to fall behind. And it is so evident if, if you go through the park of the things that have been left behind. We've talked about the, um, the grill that rusted through. That must have been rusting through for the last five, maybe even 10 years. I don't know. But that was complete uh, neglect uh, of, of our park assets. We need you, you, each one of you, to provide vision, direction, hope, and a, a vision for a, a better Marinwood for tomorrow. And we need you to inspire the staff and hold them accountable for achieving that vision. I think you have it within you. If you don't, you're just kind of wasting your time here. You know, you should watch a movie or something instead of come to these meetings because simply approving the same old, same all is not going to just even keep us even uh, in the community because rust happens, erosion happens, death happens, all kinds of stuff happen. And we need to be pushing back and, and growing. That's it. And I'm muted, sorry. Thank you, Stephen, for that comment. Um, any other raised hands, Eric? Yeah, one second, please. Okay, thank you. Jason. Yeah, I'll keep it short. Um, I was curious, I was recently reading uh, <clears throat> that California is now the first state to phase out gas powered leaf blowers and lawnmowers. Um, and I was curious what the plan was uh, with Marinwood because I guess Governor Newsom signed this bill into law at last October, and I guess it goes into effect in 2024. So I was just wondering what what the plan was for for you know kind of accommodating that phase out. That's all I had. Okay, thank you, Jason. Um, I. Is that a, should we wait until later in during Parks and Rec or could Luke or you comment on that now, Eric? Uh, if, if Luke's got something, he's welcome to. Um, I don't have much to, to answer with, except that um, if, uh, if this actually ends up staying in effect um, come 2024, we'll have to buy some new equipment. And um, there are some, uh, pieces of equipment that we use that have a good alternative and there's some that do not at the moment. So, um, you know, we'll, we stay up on what the current trends are with our um, different pieces of machinery and equipment. And, you know, what I, I read a lot of uh, consumer reports and, and reviews on things and stay up on, on products that are coming out. And I'm sure that this legislation has sparked a lot of innovation and a lot of uh, companies will be pushing to bring out um, you know, different versions of, of, you know, leaf blowers and chainsaws and lawnmowers and stuff that do not use gas. And so um, I'm sure there'll be a lot of things on the market. Um, there's not a whole lot of options at the moment, but I'm sure that'll change in the coming years. So we'll be, um, you know, staying up on that and, and replacing things as needed, if needed. So. Thank you, Luke. And I'm sure we will start putting a writing in to our line items with budget that this may be coming down the line and might be taken needing to be taken care of like we do with everything else. All right. Um, is there any other public questions or comments? You have no more comments. Okay, perfect. So moving on to district matters. Uh, the first thing that we have is um, a request from the Juarez family for placement of the memorial bench at the Marinwood Park horseshoe pits in memory of Jim Juarez, and we're being asked to approve this. Does anybody have any comments? Or Eric, did you want to say something about this? Yeah, I give you a lead in. Um, so uh, 
Sean Juarez, who was Jim Juarez's son, a uh, local resident, uh, reached out to me a while back with this request. Um, you can see his letter attached and included in the board packet. This was discussed at the PNR meeting last month because that is how our policy is written in that uh, requests such as this go through the respective commissions first. Um, I will say, and Chris and or Luke, who are both at the meeting, are certainly welcome to add. Uh, it was incredibly well received by the PNR Commission. They voted unanimously to recommend that the Board of Directors approve this request as well. Uh, as staff, we certainly recommend that it is approved. Um, the one uh, item that we did discuss is obviously there's work being done to that area. Um, some refurbishment of the horseshoe pit area has always been part of the plan, is written in on the plans. So uh, we wanted to uh, get a little further along before we actually place a bench and just be able to uh, be a little bit more thoughtful in its placement with the overall design and work that's happening to that entire area. Um, otherwise, we certainly recommend and then would uh, ask the board to just uh, direct staff to work directly with the Juarez family as, in terms of, you know, bench selection and placement and every, you know, language on the plaque, everything else. That sounds, that sounds very thoughtful and like a very good idea. Um, anybody else have any questions or comments you want to say about this? Uh I'll just jump in, Eric. That was a that was a great recap, and just say that it was, um, it was you know, we often discuss things that um, you know are are you know we have to go back and forth on them, and, and maybe we question some things. Um, it was really nice to spend a, a few minutes celebrating Jimbo um, and just everybody acknowledging the fact that when we have somebody who's such an important member of our community that unfortunately passes. Um, that we definitely take the opportunity, especially uh, with the family supporting this so much, um, to recognize them in, in a way that is both powerful for the community and also powerful for the family. Um, and I want to acknowledge the fact that um, Jimbo's wife, Margo, and his daughter, Stephanie, are on with us right now. And I'm so happy to have you guys join us tonight. Thanks, you guys. Okay. Anybody else have anything that they wanted to say? I think that's a good segue. I'm sorry, go Make ahead. Make a motion Kevin. before we... Well, what I would like to do, actually, instead of just before you go to regular public comment, I'd actually like to bring over, there's a member, as Chris said, there are members from the Juarez family, one of whom has their hand raised. I'd like to bring them over to speak to their request, not necessarily as part of a public comment on this, but as uh, somebody directly involved in this particular request, if uh, that is okay. okay with all of you. I think that No, that's it's fine. Good. Yeah. Great, of one course. second. Do that. Hello, Margo. Yeah. Great. I uh, saw your hand was raised. Wanted to give you an opportunity to speak to this, please. Yeah, I just want to tell you um, that Sean is down in San Diego um, helping his daughter move home in the next couple of days from San Diego State. So I just want to quickly say that um, uh, a thank you to all of the kind words uh, from the Park and Rec meeting last month all the kind words that you guys shared about your relationships with Jim, including Steve Nestor. He was uh, the one person from outside the park and rec who spoke so kindly of Jim. And Jim was definitely a very positive person and represented the best of what Maroonwood stands for, fr family, friendship, and inclusiveness. So I just wanna thank you all for considering the request for a bench and it makes us all very, um, sometimes emotional. So thank you very much. Thank you. And I only briefly um, met your dad. He was coming. Husband. To, husband, sorry. <laughs> oh, sorry. Um, okay. Coming to the um, Water Devil practice and um, definitely a character talking everybody up. And uh, we enjoyed having him um, interacting, even though I don't know him, didn't know him very well. And my condolences, it's um, very hard, um, especially nowadays to lose somebody. And I, I, my condolences and thank you so much for being such a wonderful part of this community. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to thank you for sharing him with all of us and letting him have the freedom to go around Marinwood and spread his smiles and on deck and you are always welcome to a swim meet um whether your granddaughters are swimming or not you guys are always part of 
the Water Devil family. Um, but I also want to thank you for everything that you both did for our community through all those for all, through all these years. So, thank you, Kathleen. You're welcome. A lot. And Stephanie too. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Val, I don't want to cut you off. Did you want to say something? No. Okay. Um, so, do I have a motion to approve? Motion to approve. Do I have a second? I'll second it. And then, do we need to vote officially on this? Uh, you got to ask for it. You, you do have some comment. other public comment. Okay, more public comment. Sorry. Sorry yeah. about that. Sure. One second. Hi, uh, if Margo's, this is Steve Nessel, and uh, if Margo's still uh, listening, I just want to, once again, you know, he, Jim really uh, moved me. He reminded me of my dad, and maybe that's why I immediately took a liking to him. He was uh, such a friendly guy, and he was the kind of person that, that kind of lived to make other people happy, and that was, that's really cool. So I'm, I'm, so thrilled that we're, we're going to honor him. And I would like to, to say, I, this is the first time I heard tonight that we're also um, uh, revamping the horseshoe pit area. I think that's great. Um, I think it needs it. And I just want to make sure that uh, the setting is a true honor and uh, we can make our park better. Uh, the, the horseshoe pit has been a huge uh, success. Um, and uh, just you know, we live in a community with million dollar homes at the minimum. And let's kind of, I, I'm not saying, you know, d sauce it up. I just, but let's, let's make sure that this is something that we can look at and, and feel proud of. Um, so that's great. I'd also, while we're on the subject, um, we have talked about a bocce court. Um, and that would be made similar. And I think that's something that should also be considered uh, at the same time of restoring uh, the horseshoe pit because it'd be very easy to do basically the same materials and equipment. So um, anyhow, that's all I have to say. I'm glad we're doing it and uh, God bless. Uh, you have no uh, other comments. Thank you for knowing what I was saying while I was muted. <laughs> okay. Um, so can we have a vote, Tiffany? Absolutely. Board Vice President Oysterman. Aye. Director Case? Absolutely, yes. Director Kilkenny? Yes. And Director Shea? Aye. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Thank and you, then uh, before we move on, Marco, I will uh, reach back out to Sean and staff will be in touch and we'll uh, start the planning process on all of this so that she is aware. And uh, give me one more second. I think that she would just like to say one more word if you're okay with that, Savon. I am totally okay with that. Marco. Myself. So just once again, thank you so much and I appreciate all your comments and have a good night. You too. Thank, thank you. you. Thank bye you bye. for joining us. Okay. Um, all right. So E2, the financial year 2022-2023 proposal of district operating budget. So we've been looking at versions of this budget for the last few meetings, and we finally have it squared away, right? Um, as squared away as a budget can be when the world changes constantly. Um, does anybody have any questions? Or Eric, did you want to have any comments. I mean, you did a great job of writing out everything in your report. So not sure what other things people might have. But. Um, yeah, I mean, if I was going to add anything, it just, you know, you guys looked at this again at the last meeting, there has any additional budget changes at this point have all been very minimal. So there's nothing I would really point out changing from last meeting to this meeting. Um, <clears throat> obviously, I have the note about the uh, deferred revenue. Uh, and just if there's any questions on what that means, it's just ultimately uh, revenue that has come in this fiscal year, but won't be applied until next fiscal year, because that's when the programs that 
uh, that revenue is intended for will happen. So that's when it gets earned. Um, we'll be deferring approximately you know, three quarters of a million in revenue. And that's just as of now, um, this is all revenue that'll come in all the way up to 630 for any program after 7-1. Um, <clears throat> and then the only other things I would uh, just kind of point out, you know, our, as of April 30th, our treasury fund was currently at 7.4 million. Um, but the net cash balance of that is actually 6.89 or 98 million just due to some of the restricted funds that are captured in there. That's actually an increase over last fiscal year at this point in time. However, that's really just a reflection of cash flow uh, and primarily due to rec programming being so much farther expanded and taking in so much cash. So I assume it'll be uh, uh, much closer to what we anticipate come June 30th, which should still represent a, a healthy net operating gain. Um, overall, the budget does uh, still project for a slightly over $400,000 net gain that is still including $100,000 towards uh, our OPEB trust and another $100,000 to be put towards the board designated reserves, both of which have been incorporated into this budget. Um, that said, there's pages of detailed notes by department as well as some district wide notes. Um, most of those have been covered in previous board meetings, but I'm happy to answer or clarify any questions that any board members may have. Um, I'm going to open up the floor. Does anybody have any questions for Eric? Board member wise? Oh, go ahead, Bill. You're on mute, Bill. There you go. Yeah. Um... Is there any reason why we can't bump up the overtime for the fire department budget wise when we're already almost double that now? Uh, I did. I, I did bump it up. Uh, I, I know. Uh, 50, you know fit, well, 50 percent from what it traditionally has been. And also, I'm hoping hopeful that we'll be able to operate at full staffing for the majority of next next fiscal year uh, which we haven't been able to do for this whole year which has incurred a lot of overtime uh, and then you also have to take that into context with uh, you know some of those the overtime that does get reimbursed through both the strike team which we're still right. waiting on reimbursement for as well as the overtime that is served in marin or in center fell that center fell reimburses us all the cost for on that as well um, that said, you know, it's, it's recognized bill, uh, and I did move it up 50% and I'm just okay. trying to see if we can ever in my time here, actually have a, a majority of a year where we can operate with our full nine staff. Uh, cause that will, that will lower the overtime significantly. Yeah. All right. And we're expecting a ninth person to come back. Uh, I am hopeful that something will be resolved there before too long. Okay. All right. That was my only. It was a good question. It's a question we all have. All right, anybody else? Okay. Um, should we motion before we open you up? Can, sure. I'll just open it up to public comment. Go ahead. That's fine. And I do want to state, and I forgot, uh, I want to thank Luke and I want to thank Chief White as well as a lot of our other staff who put a lot of time. I mean, the budget is a multi-month process in putting it together and doing a lot of research and analyzing and planning for programs. And uh, Chief White took his time to meet with me. Uh, all of the fire captains next door took their time to meet with me. Luke certainly put a lot of effort into this, as did Robin and JP. Um, and so I just, it, it's really appreciated. It's a, it's a team effort in putting the budget together. It's a, it's a large project that uh, multidisciplinary departments takes a lot of thought and effort. And uh, so thank you guys very much. And it, we can see it because the numbers don't change that much with each iteration. It's clear that even at the beginning, you guys have done a lot of work and put a lot of thought into it. So the numbers in the budget isn't wildly moving around as we're amending it. So yes, thank you so much, everybody, for your hard work. All right, um, comments from the public? Yeah, one second. Um, so uh, it's really nice to see the fat revenue growth. Uh, you know, thank God for inflation. Our real estate prices are going up and their tax uh, revenue is going up along with it. Of course, we're going to be hit with uh, inflationary costs like every, every family will, will be. Um, I, I alluded to this before. Uh, we live now in a community where the average house is 
worth at least a million dollars, some a lot more. And we really need to look at our park differently. If you look at our park, it's I believe it's 14 acres, just Marinwood Park, this local park. Um, and we only really maintain, actively maintain about half that, or maybe even a third. Um, that part is, is maintained well, but uh, other areas of Marinwood Park are being ignored. And um, so in general, I think the budget is fine. However, we need more resources where it counts. When we build up our park, we're building up our community. We're building pride in our community. And quite frankly, we're putting money in your pocket. And so, you know, the vision for the Miller Creek Trail, uh, a functional picnic area, uh, accessibility concerns, bathrooms, a, a, uh, a horseshoe pit that looks like a horseshoe pit in a sophisticated community, uh, perhaps a bocce court. These are, these are things that we really should have in, in Marinwood Park and the resources need to, to um, be devoted in that area. Um, I wish some of you would speak more uh, uh, passionately about our parks. I, 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 I hate to be the only one doing that. I know I'm not the only one who is passionate about our parks, but it really is half of what we do. And with the amount of money that we take in, there's no reason why we can't have what we want. That's all I have to say. Thank you for your comment, Stephen. Okay. Um, do I have a motion? You, you have another comment. Oh, I have Come another on. comment. Sorry. Yes, Sorry no about problem. that. One second. Jason. Yeah, um, I don't know where this fits in the agenda, but from the last meeting, I believe there was a request to provide an update on the tennis courts. Um, and I also am not sure how, I'm, I'm kind of new to this process, so I don't know whether I can respond once an answer is given or whether I'm just put back on mute, but um, it would be good to know about that as well. Um, but essentially the question is, uh, you know, the, the, the cracks in the new tennis courts are a concern to me. Um, the response was that, well, they're still playable. And of course they're playable, but they were just resurfaced in the fall. Um, and I think there was gonna be some, some investigation into that a little bit further and a response to that. Um, and, and the reason I'm, I'm bringing this up again is that the lower courts are arguably not playable. And um, the, the upper courts are essentially used a lot for lessons, uh, and, and which means that the lower courts are the only courts that are available. Um, the lower courts uh, have a lot of water damage. There's it, the, 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 it's not just the cracks, there's just a lot of dead spots that cause the ball to, to bounce in a way that, that makes it really not playable. Um, so so the, the whole question of whether something is playable or not is I think kind of like a non-answer to the question about the fact that these cracks are already showing up in the brand new surface courts. So, and, and the reason that this is a concern to me is that you know, um, the lower courts have been neglected so far that, you know, I would hate to have the upper courts get to the same level of disrepair that the lower courts are. So um, I just was, was curious whether there was, was any kind of um, further investigation into what the state of the upper courts was and, and how to remedy that problem. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Jason, for your comments. So Currently, we were taking comments about the budget and anything about the tennis courts and stuff would technically fall under the parks and recreation matters. So just for future reference, uh, since you said you didn't know if this is where that's where um, it would be. Um, and so we will address the comment um, when we talk about the parks and rec that you just gave, because it is actually not actually about the budget itself. It's about the status of the courts and not about how we're gonna be spending money in the budget, okay? Um, and in general, we don't do a back and forth. Um, so I'm answering questions because you're new to coming, but we don't do a back and forth during 
these comment periods. All right, so can I have a motion to um, approve the- Motion to approve. Thank you, Bill. Is there a second? I'll second it. <laughs> I'm usually the seconder, I know, it's hard. All right. So we both unmuted at the same time, so I thought he would jump in it, so I'll second it. Tiffany, could we have a vote? Of course. Board Vice President Loiserman. Aye. Director Case. Aye. Director Kilkenny. Aye. Director Shea. Aye. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, all right, we are skipping ahead. We are not doing E3, so we move that to next month. Um, then we have the district manager report from Eric. Uh, yeah, thank you. I'm going to uh, actually parlay off of uh, Mr. Hazrick's comment there uh, and go a little bit out of order. Um, and then obviously Luke can speak more to this during his report. Um, a, a few things came up that kind of involved capital projects last month. Uh, one of those was, you know, just some of Chris's uh, questions or thoughts about future discussion around, you know, kind of big big projects or uh, would basically we kind of refer to as capital projects. Um, the tennis courts uh, would certainly fall in, into that. And actually uh, we have long kind of maintained a list of capital, uh, capital needs as well as recently accomplished projects for the last several years. So that's actually gonna be planned for the agenda next month. Um, so you can kind of look at this in context of a lot of the larger capital projects. Um, the tennis courts are certainly part of that list. Uh, so there will be certainly some more conversation around all of all of the projects in general. Um, and again, if Luke wants to touch a little further on tennis courts in his report, that's great. Uh, and uh, Mr. Hazrick, I would certainly um, encourage you and welcome you to you know reach out to staff. We're happy to talk to you uh, outside of the kind of uh, formal meeting standpoint. Um, we're always pretty accessible and, and easy to find. Um, so anyway, that's for next month, uh, and just thought that would be a, a good way to respond to some of the comments that came up last month. Um, <clears throat> in regards to the other items, I do have an update on the Miller Creek Trail uh, initiative because that had come up. I uh, was able to uh, speak with and receive a formal letter from Robert Eaves, who is kind of the principal developer of the senior facility in regards to the project, um, cost sharing, reasonable expectations. Um, and, you know, again, these conversations have always been very amiable, just trying to kind of figure out because they're trying to work off of something that was written 16 years ago. Uh, so a lot of circumstances have changed in that time. And, you know, I think we've kind of reached and he came to a good conclusion on that. Uh, it would make sense that uh, if we there was a way to ascertain a cost for developing the trail as directed by the county and as described in the uh, in the division agreement that uh, that would be the amount that they would contribute towards this in you know for modern day construction costs i actually think that is a fair solution and a fair compromise um, uh, however we don't know exactly what that is so i reached back out to timothy best who is the one who produced the incredibly detailed report um, uh, robert eves definitely thought he would be a a, uh, a recognized expert in this as well to say, uh, hey, if you could revisit this agreement and based on your personal uh, reconnaissance of the area, provide a, uh, uh, a cost estimate for building a trail as described in this report, or if you feel that one of the trails that's already listed in your report as an option uh, would meet this, let us know that too. Um, he did get back to me very quickly, but also inform me that he's out of town until the end of the month, um, but he would be happy to work on this upon his return. So as soon as I can get some of that information from him, we could put some concrete numbers behind that. I really don't even want to speculate on what those numbers would be. I'd rather uh, wait and get the information from a subject matter expert on that. Um, so that is where we are. And again, um, Mr. Eves, you know, certainly recognizes um, that they do have an obligation to this. And we're just trying to figure out what is a reasonable expectation for that obligation, um, given that the district is, uh, I believe, you know, kind of decided it. the staff strongly recommends that we're, it would be irresponsible to build the trail as described in that initial uh, agreement from 2006 and the only option we would really recommend would be uh, you know unfortunately the most expensive option that uh, Tim Best presented in his report which is you know closer to a $275,000 project. Um, 
with that, moving on, uh, the park maintenance facility, um, I, we actually received our temporary certificate of occupancy today from the county. Um, so that is a good thing that basically says they have signed off on the building itself. Um, however, the permit does not get closed out uh, until all the items on the that are listed on the permit are either deemed not going to be completed uh, or have been completed. Um, and the other big items on there, obviously, really only thing remaining is the courtyards and then a couple other planning conditions. Um, I can also tell you, and I'm happy to tell you that yesterday, the uh, notice inviting bids for the courtyards was posted and uh, sent to all of the required agencies, including Marin Builders, North Coast Builders Exchange, and two statewide agencies uh, with requests to distribute to their members. Um, so that'll be open for about four weeks. And then we uh, are anticipating, hopefully, uh, any bids received. Uh, will be analyzed for qualifications and then the low bids from that uh, along with a summary of the entire bid process will be presented to the board for potential approval at your June board meeting. So lots of things going on in June, um, but that is a good thing. It was certainly kind of a lot of work and uh, needed to go back and kind of revisit some grading and some drainage uh, issues through there, but that is out. So we are happy and now it's just a, uh, a waiting game to hope that bids come in uh, and uh, inquiries are received. Um, a quick update, and I'm sure the chief will touch on this. I just wanted to touch on a couple things regarding some of the Marin Wildfire Prevention Authority projects. Uh, we do currently have goats grazing in Marin Woods open space. Um, they recently finished up their grazing uh, around the base of Grasshopper Hill, uh, which is kind of northeast Marin Wood. And now they are currently uh, behind Idleberry Road and will be making their way along that open space from the county facilities all the way down and around past Miller Creek uh, Road until they cross over Queenstone Fire Road. Um, so that's always fun. Uh, I, I, I will say, um, obviously, uh, just kind of reminding the public, you know, please don't go pet the goats. Don't walk your dogs near the goats. We have had an incident uh, occur already with an off-leash dog. Uh, that was a bit of a shame. Um, so we are, uh, you know, just trying to get some some word out about that. Um, and then they will be finishing up the work on uh, on uh, Queenstone Fire Road coming soon. And then uh, just a large thanks once again to Chief White, his staff, um, because you might have already had somebody come by your home, but the residential defensible space inspectors have been out for the past couple of weeks. Uh, doing our uh, free residential inspections and home hardening evaluations, uh, and uh, also providing information about upcoming chipper days, which is free opportunities for uh, any of this flammable vegetation to be chipped and hauled at also no cost to the homeowner. And all of this is funded through the Marin Wildfire Prevention Authority. Uh, and all of these things are actually core projects, um, although the D-space comes out of our D-space budget, but uh, the chipper days are part of the core the core space. The inspections we pay for and the uh, chipper days are paid for through the core. So uh, hopefully that uh, kind of fills you in on a lot of the other things that are going on and happy to take any questions. Anybody have any questions? I have two things I wanted to say, but I'm happy to take a back seat for a sec. Um, I'll just say that, uh, Eric, I totally agree that we should wait for them to come back with the number. I'm talking about the, the trail update. Um, but I, I think we need to think about that, uh, just in the sense that, you know, much like our, our maintenance facility became more expensive because we had to wait for a while to build it just because they put out a number, you know, in 2006, I, I like, I don't know, I, I, I really feel like they should be taking additional responsibility um, for making this not just some flimsy trail that was discussed a long time ago. Had they built it then, we would have accepted it then, but they're building it now, so we should be reviewing that. Just, But I totally agree we should be waiting for what they come back with, and hopefully it all works out. Um, my second, this is more of a question, on the park maintenance facility does that mean that we can tighten up the fencing? I know we've been discussing that fencing and and potentially moving it closer to the to the facility once some of that work was done. Or are we still going to wait until we finish at least the west courtyard? 
Uh, that's a good question, Chris, uh, and I uh, certainly have an answer for you. There's a couple other factors at play involved here. One is there's what's known as a bioretention pit um, that is serves as a drainage pit uh, for, uh, you know, kind of coming off the roof lines um, through there that all the water has to drain into. Uh, our staff is going to be constructing, you know, probably an 18 inch tall split rail fence to go around that. And that is actually right on the edge of where the fence is. Another aspect of what that we have added to the RFP as a uh, additional alternate, uh, just because we wanted to get some costs and thought that it would be smart to add it is that the actual um, construction and installation of the revised trail that is going to go through that area. Um, it doesn't mean we have to accept it, but we certainly wanted to see what some of the costs were on it in the event that it comes in at a reasonable cost. Um, if that's the case, it would make a lot of sense to have it uh, laid out and put in at that same time. Um, so if we are going to be doing that, uh, we would probably keep the fences where they are the time being so that way we can get that trail put in and laid out and going through that area because it'll involve them kind of digging down a little bit um, as part of the grading work and then, you know, laying the weed barrier, the base material, and then the ultimately the trail material at the same area. So as much as I'd like to pull them in, it would just made too much sense um, to include uh, as a potential um, additional alternate to the bid. Uh, the actual construction and implementation of that revised trail that'll be going through there because it'll be a very clearly defined um, trail that goes through. Totally makes sense. Thanks, Eric. Of course. Anybody else have anything? So, Chris, I, I agree with you on what you said about the Miller Creek Trail, but from what I understood from Eric, we're going to do the proper trail no matter what. And clearly there has been huge amount of costs of material and increase in interest rates right for everything so um the number we're going to get is going to be much higher but then um when we had talked about this previously eric you had said that john campo is going to really be helping us out with this and this is his area of expertise and he knows um like where to get grants and stuff so even if there is going to be um a chunk of change left over it sounds like we're going to be able to get some grants and it won't be coming totally out of our pocket um so while it would have been nice that they paid the whole 275 or whatever it is that um i think at least a portion of it a large portion should be either covered by them or by grants does that make oh so, no i i totally understand where we're going i just wanted to be on record as saying i you know i I think they should be really stepping up because this is really a condition of their being able to develop that property. I agree. I agree. And if you, I, if you don't meet that condition, you can't build on the property. It's that simple. I have one correction though. I don't think we agreed a hundred percent or approved which way we were moving on this until we heard back from them. That was That's my true. Question. We didn't, we didn't, we didn't, approve a specific trail but all of the no, indications no, no but said, no yeah. no but <laughs> it well, was no, the reason we're talking about the 275,000 is the one that was the one that they recommended as the one that was the most stable and good for the environment and for the people correct eric that's why we well it would also it would present the least amount of future maintenance it would be uh built properly and go through there properly and it would be built to last uh to the degree where uh, the only maintenance it really need for the foreseeable future is you know cleaning up some limbs that fall across it and things along those lines any of the other trails um would certainly not fall under that category and I would not recommend building any of the other ones besides the option 1a that was presented in that report. Correct. I just wanted to correct the statement that we have not approved it yet. No, you're correct. We haven't approved anything right now. We're still in information gathering um, and this is still a uh, an initiative, not an approved project. Correct. Yep, absolutely. Um, I had something any... else to add on there, but I, I, I don't totally remember what it was but uh yeah i mean let's see what tim comes back with and 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 obviously as soon as we get that information we'll we'll bring it to the forefront uh and go okay. from there i guess i had one last question about the ghosts would it be helpful if the middle school and the two elementary schools that are kind of right here emailed out to their people 
uh, to be careful and maybe do leash dogs while they're walking by that area? Um, sure, it would be helpful. I don't, uh, you know, and it doesn't hurt to ask them. I think they're, the schools are sending out a ton of other information and That's getting true. towards end of school year and everything else. We do have some next door posts that are out there that uh, uh, Quinn Gardner, the deputy emergency manager for the city of San Rafael has put out that those have gotten some good comments on them as well and some clarification from her. Uh, also includes some some mapping um, and we're just kind of hoping the dog incident was a isolated incident. It's the only time either of us had ever had something like that happen within the goats that we've had out there, but I just think it's also more a little of a common sense. Uh, it seemed like it was a little bit of a neglectful dog owner in that uh, in that particular incident. Okay, I just wanted to confirm because you know you've got a middle school teacher and me and the uh, LVE and so you had people that can send out. Okay, Chris, tell um, all your students not to pet the goats. Yeah, uh, that that would mean that they're listening to me. It's a little late. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, and they're middle schoolers. Do we have any public comment? Uh, yeah, that's it for the board. No problem. Um, well, help me understand something. We, we do have a la landscaping department, right? So when we do some of these projects, um, it's basically landscaping. We, our, our land, our, our crews have built fences. They planted, they've planned areas like right in front of, uh, the community center. I don't, I think if we want to see how our resources can uh, go further, um, I think we should really look towards doing some of the, the finish up the, the project in house. Now we had a quote for $450,000, I think for the fence. And one of the that and that was several years ago. And one of the reasons why was the architect specified Epe, which is a, an exotic hardwood, um, instead of cedar. Cedar, uh, you know, if you're a woodworker, you understand this. It's a, a buck seventy a board foot, and Ipe is ten times that. It's seventeen bucks a board foot. Now that was a couple of years ago. It's probably double that now. Um, I first of all, I I don't know what was sent out uh, specifications wise, but I guarantee you can save a lot by re-specifying the materials and the construction um, uh, the construction specs. I, you know, we want to build, build Miller Creek Trail and I'm going to just say it, I think probably the best way we could, the cheapest way, but also uh, the best way because we will have the most control is to you know uh, hire a few extra staff in the parks department we now have the room for them um, and a hands-on supervisor now this is you know different than what we've done in the past but if we have great visions if we want to expand our our uh the quality of our parks um, i'm told that our staff is overworked as it is Let's get more staff. Let's get more resources on the problem. I think we would end up saving money and building something more beautiful. Now, of course, a lot of that has to do with who you hire and the vision that you're trying to achieve. And lastly, I would say it might make sense to hire a landscape designer to look at the entire CSD property and give us some ideas for improvements. Uh, I recommend uh, you all go to the Presidio. They've remade that area and there's some really wonderful enhancements. Um, there's no reason why we can't do the same in Marinwood Park. Thank you, Stephen, for that comment. Do we have another comment from the public? Uh, no, there are no other hands raised. Okay. Um, so this is just your report. Okay. Um, moving on to fire department matters. Chief, you're up. Well, good evening. 
uh, District Manager Dreykosen and Acting President Oysterman and Mrs. Kobrink and the directors. Uh, good to see you again. Uh, I'll try to keep this as succinct as I can, although there's quite a bit of information. I'll give you a summary on the Marin Wildfire Prevention Authority recent activity to start with. Um, I'm not sure if you recall, but I was the Ops Committee Chairperson for the development of this year's 2022-2023 work plan. And as such, um, we met in April, uh, the committee did, and as did an ad hoc finance committee meet to discuss the work plan and a variety of core projects. And if you recall, the core is roughly 60% of the allocation of the Measure C funding. Um, there was some increase or proposed increases for the projects and some of those proposals that would have adversely impacted a lot of or all of the agency's core allocation had we approved the request and the projects as they had come in. Fortunately, most if not all of those projects were scalable. Uh, and as a result, um, based on questions I had and some of the other fire chiefs and other attendees had, um, we spoke with the uh, director, Mark Brown, and his staff, and Creelock, and tried to get more information and figure out just how we could ensure that um, the concerns we had were addressed, but also look at scaling back some of the cost and projected uh, requests for public education, environmental compliance, uh, home hardening and grants, uh, those, the, the direct assistance programs where you have staff come right out directly to the home, much like when we've had AmeriCorps personnel come out directly to properties. And along with the CHIPPER program and an evacuation risk assessment study, which was actually discussed on its own merit um, with the board of directors, largely in part because I think there was a lot of interest in that particular item. But that being said, um, after meeting and going back and reviewing the projects and ensuring that we had um, understanding about the, the scope of some of the projects, the intent, the uh, metrics involved, we um, uh, ended up meeting again uh, just at the end of the month after the advisory, advisory technical committee had came back with their pro proposals and suggestions on how we could achieve savings and still meet the objectives that we had outlined for 2022, 2023. And so with that, the final meeting was held last week on May 3rd, and we have what we believe is a finalized product that will be going forward to the Marin Wildfire Prevention Authority Board of Directors on May 19th for review and consideration. And so with that, um, there's a lot of information, a lot of um, projects and proposals, and they really continue the great work that's been done over the first two years of the MWPA. Um, but that being said, we wanna still ensure that what we're doing um, continues to redu reduce risk, ensure that we create um, mechanisms for not only now, but for in the future on how we prioritize projects and how we can move forward effectively to continue to draw down risk and ensure that the funds are being spent in the manner that will really get a lot of work done. And that was the, I think the big concern as we met about the core and the impact to our budgets locally, um, not on the local pot, but locally uh, uh, by agency, is that if we start handing a lot of money back over to other entities and other um, responsibilities, although it may have a countywide effect and it may be helpful in the long run, it still doesn't help the agencies themselves target specific projects they may have in their own community. And so this was a fine balance that we're trying to to meld here between how we do work countywide and within zones, but also locally. So you still have the revenue available to get substantial work done in your own communities. And so that balance, I think we achieved it this year, but moving forward, um, it's certainly gonna require um, a lot of back and forth and some, some focus and some future metrics being put in place to ensure that the work that's being done, you can see the progress, but also project where work needs to go next year after year. So be looking for more information on that as we move forward. And if there's any concerns or anything unique that comes out of the board of directors meeting on the 19th, I'll certainly report back that information next month. Um, District Manager Drakerson spoke earlier about some of the other work that's already started as of just the last week or so, uh, including the goat grazing that started on Grasshopper Hill and it's moved towards Idleberry Road. In addition, uh, there's also additional work taking place for um, on Queenstone, and that work involves fire mulching on the fire roads, or excuse me, mulching on the fire roads. 
And so given that, um, there's a lot of good work taking place right now. I know the inclement weather has kind of impacted a little bit, but not, you know, terribly. We had masticator work that was being performed on Queenstone Fire Road. And if you looked at the photos in the report, you could see the substantial change in the difference between the um, before and afters. And it's just amazing to see what that, that, uh, that piece of equipment can accomplish. It's, uh, it's unique. I haven't seen it in person, but I've actually seen the outcome. And a masticator is really a, a great tool to, to grind down stumps and other areas that could uh, pot potentially create some travel and or other hazards for um, equipment. So if you look at the before and after photos on that particular fire road, um, amazing roadside clearance, but also just really effective work being done with that piece of equipment. So we expect to be utilizing that more and more throughout the community as we see uh, the need and the uh, value. Uh, moving on to COVID and vaccinations. I'm not gonna touch on this one too much, but um, clearly, although we may be moving out of the pandemic, there's um, significant concerns starting to surface about the rate of infection that's happening here in the Bay Area. Uh, and I think we're seeing clearly within our communities in Marin that there's a, a increase in the number of infections that are taking place at large gatherings and or at schools, as an example. I was just at the, uh, the May Madness car show and it was a beautiful day on Saturday and there was just literally hundreds of people up and down 4th Street. And it just made me wonder all for just a brief moment, everything felt pre 2020 and it just felt good. But I wondered later on, was that a false sense of security? And I certainly hope not. But that being said, uh, there's a new sub variant to the sub variant that had been talked about a while back, the BA2. Um, the other variant is called the BA2.12.1. Starts to get a little complicated. I wish they would just name it as opposed to giving it all these scientific numbers. But that being said, um, it first really was discovered and surfaced on, in the US back on the East Coast. And it was a concentrated area where this was really taking hold and moving quickly. Well, apparently that, that same um, variant has now moved out West and it's taking hold and moving pretty quickly out here. Uh, it's, it's leading to an increased number of hospitalizations, but really not necessarily the deaths at this point. And that's the encouraging thing about what's going on with the sub variant is that there's illness and, and people are getting the symptoms and signs, but not really the deaths that we saw roughly two years ago when the, the pandemic started to peak, when the numbers were rising much the way they are right now. So I'm just hopeful that these are diluted versions of the original COVID that'll give us you know, flu-like symptoms, but not really have the same long-term or even severe outcomes as before. So that being said, um, different communities are considering going back to masking, different communities are considering other mandates. Uh, I haven't heard of anything really coming forward in Marin County at this point, but that could very well change depending on hospitalizations and whether or not we see a continued spike or increase in the number of infections in our community. And as we approach the summer months, the possibility of this really looms. And so I'll provide a little bit of update on that next month as, as we're able to watch the trend of how this is um, playing out. Um, moving on to Friday, April 15th the San Rafael Fire Foundation had been looking at ways to show our first responders in both San Rafael and Marinwood some form of appreciation for the, um, the difficult and the commitment they showed, the difficult work and the commitment they showed throughout the pandemic. And someone had an idea of doing a magic show. Somebody had an idea of, you know, having a big breakfast gathering, kind of like the way <laughs> the pancake breakfast would be, but it just seemed like that was kind of difficult to do right now. So they, they landed on going to Andy's market and creating a bunch of food baskets. And those food baskets consisted of um, meatless, uh, meatless meat or meatless sausage, uh, hickory smoked bacon or maple bacon. Oh, that was delicious. I tasted some. I stopped by one of the stations, excuse me. Um, delicious orange juice, coffee, um, uh, Trying to think of what else. There was a pancake mix in there. There was some maple syrup. There was um, a dessert bread that looked like something that all you had to do was put heat to it and it would just melt in your mouth, not in your hand. Uh, so I, I just have to say that those baskets were um, well received by the, the firefighters. And on this particular trip, um, I came out to 58 um, with 
uh, baskets for the A, B, and C shift. And Council Member Rachel Kurtz wanted to join me as I made my rounds to stations 56, 57, and 58. So she stopped by with uh, her Labrador, and I forgot its name already. It might be Laura or Londa or something similar. And uh, we sat and talked with the crews for a little while and um, just basically got a chance for them to, you know, receive the, the generosity of the San Rafael Fire Foundation. So all that to say, uh, I hope the crews enjoyed that treat and that feast. I know I would have certainly given what I just tasted that bacon by itself and that juice of just mouthwatering. So if any of you have a chance, swing by Andy's Market and grab some one day just to see. Um, Miss Laura Franklin of the, uh, Miss Laura Franklin's kindergarten class at Mary E. Silvera. So, oh, let me, let me make sure I'm saying that right. So you got that, it right. You know? Did I say it right the first time, Silvera? Yes, you did. Okay, I, I thought maybe it was Silva, Silva Ira or something like that. So I just, Silvera, great. Um, the uh, crew at 58, Captain Subatella, Engineer Brian Smith, and Firefighter um, Paramedic Sean Day came by and actually uh, shared a couple of interesting stories and taught the class about what the day in the life of a firefighter would be like. And uh, the students were all ears and eyes. And so given that, we have a great photograph of of them sitting there and uh, the, the, the students tuned in. Um, I gotta tell you, when they get about five or six years older than that, it's gonna be a struggle to keep their attention. I know because I used to go to the schools and, and try to have uh, one-on-ones with the class and there'd be somebody with their head down on the desk. This is Oakland. I don't know if it's gonna be true in Marinwood. There'd be somebody else looking at their phone. It was just, hey, stop it. What are we doing here? <laughs> so that's the perfect age. You wanna go and engage them because they're still listening. Um, that being said, uh, that was a great snapshot, and thanks for sharing uh, that, Miss Laura Franklin. Um, acting Captain Qualified, Engineer Jeff Smith. Over the last couple of years, he's been working hard to meet the requirements that are outlined in our Memorandum of Understanding. And so the pre-qualifications, the courses and the training, and the evaluations that all three shifts have to provide to Jeff um, really landed on the idea that he's more than prepared and that they're more than confident that he's capable of meeting the expectations of a company officer uh, in an acting capacity. And, and that usually translates into, into a permanent capacity if that opportunity ever were to surface. And so given that, our congratulations go out to um, Jeff Smith for being qualified now to act captain. And to quote Captain Papa Nicola, he said he had the pleasure of working with Jeff on a shift for the last three years. And he's uh, confident in his ability to fulfill the role. He's proven himself as a reliable team member and consistently demonstrates excellent technical ability, problem solving skills, and attention to detail. His competency and calm demeanor have earned him the respect of his peers and he'll have no trouble adapting to the role of supervisor as required. And so that's a, a, a ringing um, verification of somebody's suitability and readiness. And so I appreciate Captain Papa Nicola taking the time to, to really express. Um, just how important this is to have Jeff meet this benchmark and meet this uh, ability. And so um, I just have to say that uh, that effort, it, it, although it takes time, it's a reward that he'll, he'll see over time as he gets more opportun opportunities to act. And that may come, who knows, as soon as this summer or when somebody goes on vacation or if there's a strike team deployment, it, it's very timely. So I'm glad to see he's completed it before we get into our heavier part of the season this year. Last but not least, take a guess. Those numbers look real close to numbers I've seen. I say that every time, but five minutes 20, I think I've seen five minutes 22. I've seen five minutes 28. This time, five minutes 20 seconds. Again, an excellent testament to our crews and their ability to get out the door quickly and get on scene quickly. When you have a total response time or an average response time of five minutes and 20 seconds, you give individuals who have a cardiac event or some other traumatic event an opportunity to survive that event. And that's done in part by the engineer and the company officer and or the firefighter knowing their district so well. So they know multiple ways to get to that district or to that location. And um, know, they know multiple ways of getting there coming from different directions. They may be out shopping. They may be on the other end of their district, but if they know how to get and expedite to their location, because they're not always at quarters when a call comes in. So you have to you have to be mindful and think about that. But 
to be able to get there as quickly as they do comes well, well within NFPA standards and recommendations for average turnout and total response time. So I just, I wish other agencies and other crews could see this on a regular basis and use this as a benchmark because this is, I won't say it's unheard of, but it's top notch. And so I'm gonna just sing their praises because this continues to be something that I marvel at and I'm probably gonna continue to marvel at it even after I've retired. So just wanted to share that so you guys can really know and understand how well our personnel are operating, um, knowing their districts as thoroughly as they do and making it a, a concerted effort to get out the door quickly when there's an, an emergency. So that being said, if there are any questions, um, I'm more than happy to answer those questions. And I think there was one thing I did want to speak on that um, I don't have the best answer for, but I believe it was Director Case who um, inquired about the trees on Miller Creek Road, the eucalyptus, the red eucalyptus, and whether or not we'd be able to get some, some resolve on that. Is, is that correct? Was it you or was it? Um, it it wasn't me, fire, it was somebody from the fire yeah. commission, but, but I'll take credit for fire commission question. meetings. Oh, well, in that case, I'll, I'll hold reserve comment for another time. I know you got other items on it, but um, I will say just briefly, um, I took a look at and I photographed the area because I've reached out to Marin, Wild, uh, Marin Wildfire Prevention Authority staff on this, and they've reached out to others in the county and gotten no response. They suggested maybe we look at this and make it a project and work closely with Quinn and her staff to see what they can do to address some of this. When I reached out to Quinn about it, um, she didn't really necessarily see this as a, a um, significant threat or danger or high priority item, but I don't know that she gets to make that determination. And so for me, I went over and looked at the location. I took photographs of it and I see clearly where there's an opportunity to perhaps engage PG&E like she suggested. But if you look at the power lines, they're actually pretty clear and away from the, the, the um, the limbs and what have you. And so with that, the areas where I did see encroachment looked like it was television and phone and or cable. And those ran literally through the limbs. And so my question would be, could I go back to PG&E and compel them to address those limbs? Or is the television and phone and cable, are those folks um, somehow responsible with PG&E? I'm assuming they're, they're connecting with PG&E utilizing their utility pole. So it still may fall back on PG&E. So I want to do a little more research on that because I haven't seen a situation in the past where PG&E would not limb an area that's just connected to their power lines. It would normally limb an area that might hit any lines that were on that pole. And I say that seeing what they did here near my home in Oakland. Um, but I just want to make sure as I'm proceeding on this, I'm knocking on the right doors and I'm asking the right questions of the right individuals so that I can get some resolve on this. Short of that, um, I think I'm trying to make a compelling case using the key buzzwords to get folks' attention, but also to get some movement on this because I do see a concern um, as far as a crown fire, but I don't know that we see a concern as far as the lines themselves that actually um, would pass through limbs and what have you. Now, if one of those lines were to come down, clearly we got a problem because it will fall right down on top of those limbs and the other foliage there, and that could be an issue. So I'm going to Try to finesse this as best I can, but I just wanted to share with you guys that there's ongoing conversation about this, but we may not have immediate resolve. So I'm going to continue to partner with Eric and others on how we can approach this strategically and get something done about it, but um, still looking at the different options. Can I just add one thing just to, it, it was Tom from the fire commission that added it, but what okay. people he does is they will go in and they will chop off one limb that's touching their line. And so that's why so many of the trees are very lopsided. And then with our winds, other branches come down, not on the PGEs, but they're, the trees are so lopsided. That's why. Right. So it, it would seem there should be a, a, I don't know, a artistic or aesthetic look when you're going to lop off something, create some balance, create some visually appealing. You know, don't just come in and butcher the trees because it's I on your line. That. I asked that the last time they came and just chopped off. I was like, could you like make Even sure that we don't fall afterwards? And they're like, no, we just chop. Well, and I think his like, other concern. Okay. Yeah, I think his other concern is because it's eucalyptus and should there be a fire, 
those will just instantly ignite and that is our main way out there's no unless we get stuck on lucas valley where you're going to have all of lucas valley estates lucas valley and the other half of marinwood trying to get out that's our only other way out no and i, I recognize that's an evacuation corridor and that's going to be part of the rationale for trying to put that as a priority project as well and we're looking at the possibility of doing this as a zone-based project and not just a Marinwood centric project, if at all possible. So there, again, there's there's a couple of approaches. I'm not <laughs> sure where we're going to land and how quickly we can land on it, but I certainly yeah. want to, to to continue to beat the drum on this and knock on the right doors and, and, and get the right attention because to not have anyone from the county respond back, that's problematic in and of itself. It's on the Marinwood um, Prevention Authority's radar, but yeah. I think their hands are tied to some degree unless there's a concerted focused effort on identifying this as part of the problem, either through the evacuation risk assessment or somehow or another through some other zone wide priority project um, that we put forward. And so, um, yeah, I, I certainly understand that. Trust me. And that's why I say I don't think others have the right to determine what's a priority or what isn't. It's the community and the staff such as yourselves that get to say we consider this a priority. We want this to move forward. Um, and then we act accordingly. Perfect. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Are there any other questions or comments? I just, I just want to echo from the board to Jeff Smith of all his hard work and his dedication to our firehouse and our community for achieving this. Thank you. I agree. That's what I was going to say if anybody else said it. Thank you, Kathleen. Um, if there's no other questions or comments, we'll see if the public has anything that they would like to share. Yeah, one second, please. Uh, yes. Uh, hi, Chief. Uh, this is Stephen Nessel, and uh, thank you for a good, detailed report. Um, I just I want to go back to the beginning of your report. You uh, you were talking about the wildfire authority. And you were referring to, I think, what you called your yearly work plan. And I'm kind of intrigued with that. Um, this yearly work plan, can you describe what it is and uh, how you use it to organize your task throughout the year and what you do to hold your team accountable? And lastly, whether you think it's a useful project, whether it, it helps you achieve your results. I'm interested because I think it's something we could be doing more of. Yes, if you're done with the, the question. Yeah, I that's that's all I uh, all okay. I have. You're all professional right, um, and I appreciate I appreciate the professional management that is required of the, the fire service. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, well, so so that you understand. Marinwood does have a work plan that's submitted every year and there the effort is partnered with the San Rafael staff uh, and Quinn Gardner and the other vegetation management um, personnel such as Kate Anderson and um, Simon Wright and Josiah Gorey and um, Manny Albano and others, Mary Scramstad, all of these staff come together and they look at projects that need to be completed in the Marinwood community and those, you know, can range from how we're addressing the open space areas. Uh, the goat grazing and herbivory treatments, um, the uh, e evacuation corridors, the roadside clearances, the trails, the um, projects like we just described on Miller Creek Road and the median, um, any number of areas that are receiving attention, whether it be deliberate mechanized work or, um, or, or uh, hand crew work or direct assistance, um, these are all projects that are normally put forward every year that we expend the funds that are available um, within Marinwood to go out and achieve the risk reduction and vegetation reduction and fuel reduction efforts in strategic areas where we move from one location to the next year after year and some are just maintenance projects that have to be done annually. But um, this actually occurs every year. The Marin Wildfire Prevention Authority website has a list of all projects that have been submitted. And so I would encourage you to take a look at that website and you can get more detail about um, those things that are actually um, on the horizon or planned for uh, Marinwood and other agencies adjacent. Currently, Director Mark Brown is also 
touring different agencies, going to councils and boards and uh, sharing information about the Ross Valley Open Space Shaded Fuel Break Project. And that's a 38 mile long project that's gonna tie in a lot of 200 foot reduction um, adjacent to um, private property throughout that particular area. And so if you, if you see that type of effort going on, that's just a, a fraction of the work that's happening throughout the county right now. But everyone in the county has to submit a work plan to outline the different projects they're proposing to complete for the upcoming fiscal year. Thank you, Chief. That was quite complete. Um, is there another comment or question from the public? No. Okay, thank you, Chief. Um, have a great night. Um, it was very, very thorough and we do appreciate your tireless efforts uh, to help us out in our community. Thank you. And you guys have a great evening as well. Thank you very All much. Right. Be safe. Take care. Thanks, Chief. All Thank right. You. So moving on to parks and recreation matters. Um, does anybody have any questions about the draft minutes of the park and recreation committee from the 26th? Okay. Um, is there any? Uh, I, don't, I don't know if Chris wanted to give a recap on it or not. Oh, Chris, did you want to give a recap? Yep, for sure. Um, <clears throat> it was actually a, a pretty quick meeting. Um, there's nothing you know, we had, we had probably the biggest thing was just talking to the Juarez family, which was really special and, and nice. And obviously we've covered that tonight. Um, there were a couple of questions about um, what I had brought up in terms of, you know, just looking at capital projects, but obviously that's going to be, sounds like dealt with next month. Um, Luke reviewed some of the highlights, some of which I think he's going to go over tonight. Um, Luke, in your in your piece, and I don't remember if we covered it in ours last month, but um, rehiring Guy, um, you know, um, and just looking at um, the drinking fountain and things like that. Um, uh, Commissioner Banesh asked for an update on the trail, which obviously will get will happen now that we have an update. Um, in terms of public comment, um, I think the thing that jumped out at me was. Stephen had mentioned the possibility for some family camps um, that maybe we could capture some interest on Saturday mornings. If I'm not mistaken, Stephen, I think that's the time frame you were talking about. Um, there was some discussion about the fireman's picnic area um, and the barbecues there, but that was already brought up a little bit tonight as well from Stephen. Um, and then that was it. We really wrapped with just coming back to the capital improvement projects that will be um, that we'll kind of get a connection to next month. Um, and if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to answer them since I was there. I am good, Kathleen, Bill. All right, uh, are there any public comments? Oh, one second. Um, yes, uh, another good uh, report, Chris. I really appreciate you filling out uh, the details. Um, there were, were a couple of things that I think you missed. First of all, when we were talking about big projects um, and, and when we say big long-term projects, we're talking, you know, maybe, I don't know, 10 years out. But uh, we know at some point we're going to have to address the pool, perhaps replace it just like uh, Lucas Valley Estates did, uh, did. And you, you brought that up. And I think that's worth mentioning. It's just putting it out there on the radar. It was a really great uh, little discussion. Um, also, um, there was a, a new commissioner. I forget the commissioner's name. He was wondering why these board meetings were not um, uh, recorded uh, because we're, of course, on Zoom. And uh, uh, Eric said, well, he doesn't record them, but if you want to know anything, uh, basically talk to me. And um, I really think, quite frankly, you know, we've got a, what is it, almost a $7 million budget. It's, it's kind of ridiculous how much money we have coming in not to record meetings like virtually every other agency uh, in Marin County just 
borders on them ridiculous to me. Um, it doesn't cost a lot of staff time to do. It just means hit record um, and uh, upload it to the um, YouTube, our YouTube channel. Um, and the benefit of this is these big ideas, like maybe a, a new pool, we can get these ideas out in the community. We can build a dialogue, build support for these big ideas. I think it's very important. We're also building community when we do that. Um, let's not isolate ourselves. Anyhow, that was, that was uh, part of what was discussed at the meeting, and I just want to make sure that was captured. We all, all also talked about uh, Jimmy Juarez for quite some time, and it was, it was a nice little uh, interchange that we had. So thank you. Thank you, Stephen, for your comment. Um, Eric, is there any other comments, public? No? OK. So moving on to the recreation and park maintenance activity report. Luke, the floor. Thanks, Yvonne. Uh, I'm going to start on the parks side uh, tonight. And um, kind of the biggest news of the last month is that we um, did just hire a new parks maintenance employee. Um, which is uh, exciting. His name's Cesar Alvarez, and um, he started this week, and we're really excited to have him. Cesar um, has a an extensive background in landscape maintenance, um, irrigation, turf management. Um, he's worked on a lot of golf courses and um, some parks and other other things. And so, um, yeah, he started this week, and we're two days in, and it's uh, it's going great. We're really excited to have him uh, on the team. Uh, not just because of the knowledge and experience that he brings, but just the fact that we're um, our staff is made whole again after um, a handful of months of being short staffed. So uh, we're really looking forward to um, you know seeing how how Caesar integrates into the team and and can help us fill that out. And um, right now it's going to be a lot of training and uh, just getting him up to speed on on how we operate. But he's a real smart guy, real nice uh, gentleman. And um, if you see him out in the parks, just you know, feel free to say hi. Um, he's a real friendly guy, and we're we're just really pleased to have him on staff. So that's um, the big the big good news on the park side. Uh, some other fun things that have been going on this last month. The straw program um, has been kind of resurrected after a couple of years off due to COVID. And that's a program that does a lot of uh, restoration work in the creek uh, area along the panhandle. They work with the middle school students at Miller Creek and they remove a lot of invasive species and plant native plants and um, which, which helps a lot with our ecosystem and curbing erosion. And um, they hadn't been around for, for a couple of years. They just did some cursory waterings and things over during the, the pandemic. But um, on uh, this last week, we had it was a, a large group out there. I mean, there was like 30 plus uh, students and you know, around 10 adults uh, supervising. And they, they, they did a lot of great work, removed a ton of ivy and blackberry and um, um, planted some stuff and, and just really cleaned up the area along the creek, pretty much between the fireman's picnic area and the park maintenance facility was the area that they focused on. Um, and our staff, uh, the usual we we lent them use of our dump trailer and we removed um, the debris when they were finished and um, the area is looking really great so we're really grateful to see them back um, helping us um, and help helping the creek stay healthy and and uh, the area around that so that was um that was great to kind of have that resume after a couple of years off um, we also uh have the staff out there this week I'm um, doing some turf fortification before the summer camps start in about a month. So um, we're doing some adding some topsoil seeding. We did some aerating last week. We'll be fertilizing and just getting things um, as green and strong as possible before the onslaught of the campers all over the grass all summer. So um, staff are working on that this week and that's going really well. Um, to touch on the question about the tennis courts, um, so I'm uh, I'm not 100% sure what was left to cover from the last meeting, but just to um, sort of cover what's going on with our with our tennis courts, we did just have a, a top coat treatment done to the upper courts, which are courts courts one and two, the ones closest to the street, closest to Miller Creek Road, 
and um, there was a, a treatment done to kind of remove the previous layer of, of um, uh, on those cords and then to fill the cracks and add another uh, a slurry coat with, um, with another paint job. And this is just a placeholder. This is not a full resurfacing. Um, but uh, this court will, will add, uh, that, that treatment will add playability to the courts for, um, for a few more years. And um, the, there are cracks that have appeared on those courts since the, the work was done. And that is to be expected. Um, that's actually written into the proposal for the work. Um, there's a lot of things that contribute to cracking in the courts. Uh, most of that's due to weather. So um, hot days, cold nights, rain, um, all, all contribute to the cracks opening up. And uh, there's only so much that this top um, kind of cursory treatment that can do for the courts. Eventually those courts will need to be fully resurfaced, but we're not there yet uh, based on our assessments from, from the, some of our experts that we work with and, and consult with. Uh, the courts are in really good condition and um, the cracks are small and they will hold for a while. And if we do get an area that's problematic, we will get it repaired before the next treatment is scheduled. And then when the courts get to a point where they're no longer, um, where, where the treatment's not gonna hold for long enough, that's the time when we will look at re doing an office thing. So um, what we're doing now is, is kind of keeping the courts playable until uh, the time comes when we need to do a, a, a bigger, um, treatment for them. Courts three and four, the courts down by the middle school, um, are in worse shape than, than the top courts, or the upper courts, and uh, those are due to receive a new top coat in the next year, and, um, uh, and then we will do repairs on those as needed. We did just get some of the, the cracks and holes that had formed in those courts repaired uh, in conjunction with the treatment we did to the upper courts most recently, which was about a year ago. And um, so those are on the schedule to be treated within the next year. And, um, we'll, and we'll do that. We are evaluating um, and getting numbers from different uh, companies, kind of unofficial estimates for what it will take to fully resurface the lower courts and dealing with how that will work with access from the middle school to get heavy equipment out there. And there's a, it's a whole process to do that. But um, we are doing research on that and we'll, we'll um, determine. We'll, we want to make sure we uh, don't, you know, spend money on another top coat if um, a resurfacing is the thing that's really needed. So before we, we do that, we'll make sure that, um, you know, we're, we're taking the appropriate treatment to those. So, um, there are cracks on the courts. They're in much better condition uh, than they were back when I when I started here. And um, you know these treatments that we are doing are keeping them playable in a way that the lower courts were not playable, um, you know, seven eight years ago. So we have been able to kind of resurrect those and keep those going. Um, but they're by no means in perfect condition, and, and we are looking at what it's going to take to get those fully resurfaced. And in the meantime, we're we're doing what we can to keep them playable. I don't know if that answers all the questions, but that's that's the information that I have, and that's kind of where we're at on the tennis courts. So, um, look, just uh, before you keep going, maybe if Jason has specific things, he can come and reach out to you, um, not during a board meeting, or maybe take pictures of exact areas that he feels like make those courts unplayable, and have that discussion with you at a later date. And, uh, Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks, time. Sivan. Okay. Yeah, that would be great. And I do yeah, encourage uh, Jason and anyone else from the public that, that has concerns or questions or feedback about the courts. Yeah, definitely contact me you know, by, by email, phone, come by. I'm happy to talk about it and kind of um, you know, have a longer conversation there. So yeah, thanks, Sivan. For Perfect. Saying that. Sorry for interrupting. No, 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 not at all. Um, and then uh, moving over to the, the recreation side, just touch on a few updates. I'm not going to talk, not talk too long, but um. Uh, Chris mentioned it, and I don't remember if I mentioned this in the last board meeting, but um, Guy Doers, um, who's been a longtime uh, employee of the district, he um, is an individual who's an adult with uh, developmental disabilities that has been attending our pool for most of his life, and, um, and we hired him in 2010 um, as part of a program with his um, organization that he's a part of called uh, PDS, um, which is um, uh, people with disabilities succeeding. And um, we, they, they have a work program for their um, participants and clients to help get them jobs in, in various areas. And so Guy got a job back in 2010, helping us with some custodial duties. 
and he's been working here ever since, had to take a long break during COVID because he's very uh, high risk for COVID and, um, and, and uh, you know, major effects from that. But we've been able to uh, have Guy come back and start working again last week, and that's been really exciting. And we've also had another individual from PDS join Guy. Um, his name's John Paul, um, not to be confused with John Paul, who works in the rec department. Um, but uh, JP or John Paul, um, yeah, has, uh, is going to be accompanying Guy on his job. They come two days a week for a couple hours and they do a bunch of cleanup around the park, around the building. And, um, and we're really excited to be able to, to have them back here and to support that program. And it's great to, to have them. And they're, they're doing great. Uh, Guy is looking great. He's in good health. And we're just really excited to have him back and excited to have him be a part of our team again. So that's been a really exciting thing. Um, and we're just really, really happy to, to have him in the office and, and around the ground. So if you see him, say hi. Um, guys, are, JP are both really friendly guys, and, and they're just helping keep our parks clean uh, um, when they're here a couple days a week. So that's been awesome. Um, and then lastly, uh, just a shout out to the recreation department, uh, specifically Robin Bruton and John Paul Kessler. Uh, Robin's our assistant recreation director, uh, and she oversees our summer camp program and all of our youth programs and a bunch of our special events and a bunch of other things. And um, we've just had, with, with COVID still playing a major role in staffing challenges, we've had um, you know, preschool teachers uh, having to be out for, for a week or more at a time. We've had after school staff having to miss um, for weeks at a time. We have a preschool teacher that's out with a disability, uh, out on it with an injury right now. And um, Robin has been filling in as a preschool teacher, as an after school counselor, uh, wrangling all sorts of new people, trying to hire people to help step in. Um, and she's been uh, continuing to, to hire and train staff. She's been teaching CPR classes to get our summer, our giant summer staff, which is, which is huge. Our summer camp staff is um, over 200 people or 150 to 200 people, um, mostly high school and college age that all that we make get trained in CPR. And most of that training comes from us doing classes for them. And Robin teaches those almost weekly, um, along with teaching babysitter training and, and just kind of keeping the office going. So Robin has been pulling long hours and just stepping in to make sure all of our programs continue running smoothly, making sure everything is going well. And um, I'm just really, uh, I really admire him and I'm impressed with Robin, uh, her dedication to keeping our programs going. The spring is the hardest time for the, for the rec staff because we have a bunch of programs happening, a bunch of planning to go to, to do, and we don't have a lot of staff at this time of the year. And summer comes, we get everybody back from school, everybody back from college, and uh, we've got a huge crew. But during the spring, it's, a, it's definitely a skeleton crew and it can be very challenging, especially with things like COVID-19 that um, require people to be out for specific amounts of time if they're exposed or test positive. And so that has been an added challenge this year. Um, and John Paul similarly at the pool has had to step in. And if you're a swimmer, you'll see him down there lifeguarding at all hours of the day, just filling in for staff here and there that have to quarantine or be out for, for other reasons. And um, they've kept great attitudes um, and fulfilling all their normal job duties, but also adding these other things that, that other people are normally doing. And I'm just very proud of them and very, um, happy to have them on board. So uh, just a shout out to them for all their dedication and hard work. And uh, everyone's looking forward to summer, which although it's hugely busy, we just have a, a really big staff that can kind of help us weather that. So um, one one more month, uh, looking at my calendar, uh, a, little, a little more than a month and we'll, we'll kind of be uh, in action there. So um, that's all I really wanted to, to highlight for my report this time around, but please let me know if anyone has any questions or would like me to touch on anything else in detail. Thank you. I have a few questions. I should probably know this. The lower, the back tennis courts, three and four, I know that a lot of that land over there is also Miller Creeks. Are they our tennis courts or are they shared with Miller Creek? Uh, this is a great question, Kathleen. Those tennis courts um, are technically on Miller Creek's uh, middle school property, and um, we have an agreement with the middle school for that um, that we can utilize those tennis courts for our programs, and we assume uh, the maintenance responsibility for those courts, um, though they exist on school property. And, uh, and okay. we're very we're very pleased with that agreement and where it stands right now. Okay, and then my other one, and I know that um, you guys are looking into this, but I also wanted to see, and this is, can be for next month, is an update on our contract with this landscape company. Um, there are a handful of 
residents that live along that walkway that are not happy with the company, the, the guys that work it. Um, and so I know that this falls under you. I don't want to micromanage. I know that they have a lot of turnover and you've done hours and hours of intervention with them <laughs> to try to make sure that it's done. But I just wanted to bring it up again to see, you know, I don't know if it's in the budget or not, but see what the difference is if we can get a different company or whatever the outcome is. Um, Kathleen, uh, thanks for that. Well, just to clarify, when you say the walkway, are you referring to uh, Creekside Trail or is there a is there a different walkway you're referring to? I mean, the only one that matters, the one from Quietwood all the way. Back. Oh, that one. Okay, okay. <laughs> um, the one that personally affects me. Just kidding. Um, there, I didn't even know there was a walkway on Creekside. I didn't even know there was a park over there, remember, or a tennis court. Um, um, so yeah, just the, there's a few houses that live, like one of them's on Quietwood, one of them's on Miller Creek. I haven't even gone all the way to Peachstone. That's someone else's territory. Um, <laughs> but I just know, that, people out, right? yeah, like one of our neighbors is waiting for the chipper day to cap down dead limbs and have them chipped away. And I said, go for it. Have fun. So. Uh, no, that's that's good. And I can definitely address and give kind of an update on, on that contract. Uh, next time around, I have to do a little bit of homework for, for that. But um, just course. know, yeah, the the landscape company that we use, Land, land Design, um, they are responsible for maintaining those walkthroughs um, along with a bunch of other areas and a bunch of other responsibilities. Um, when it comes down to, to some of the tree maintenance on those walkways, we do sometimes have to bring out other contractors to handle, you know, tree trimming or, or if they're hazards. And I do encourage anybody that has concerns about those walkways to contact me directly. Um, and we can sometimes deal with those either through the landscape company, if it's within the kind of the contract um, confines or if it's something that we need to go above and beyond that and, and do something in house or, or hire a different type of contractor to come out. But, um, but, you know, I just encourage anyone, you know, definitely to touch base with me. And we have done a lot of work out there um, in the last year. Um, it's a long stretch and there's multiple stretches of, of walkway th throughout the neighborhoods there. Um, but we've, yeah, we had a lot of tree work done on some of those uh, areas and um, there's, there's probably more to be done, but um, definitely it's, it's on our radar. But if anyone has specific concerns, um, I would, you know, appreciate them contacting me directly so I can make sure we address I, those. I tell them. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. All right. I just want to be conscious that it's 915. Um, just make sure that you welcome Mr. Alvarez from the board that we are super excited to have him on board. And I have told the original Jean-Paul and uh, Robin, thank you so much, especially when I went over there earlier yesterday, <sighs> right after the hailstorm that we had, and they were out there. I said my appreciation, but I did not realize how much is on Robin's plate. So please, you know, let her know we totally appreciate it. Um, Absolutely. Bill and Chris, do you guys have any questions? Otherwise, we'll go to the public. I don't have any questions. I'm just uh, excited to hear about the capital improvements um, next month. We'll, we'll, I'm assuming that will include like maybe costs for the complete resurfacing of those back tennis courts. Um, and uh, and I, you know, maybe looking at expanding some of our offerings with things like, you know, do we put pickleball lines on there if we're going to resurface them and and, you know, do stuff like that. There's a lot of land right next to those tennis courts in the back that clearly belongs to the district, but maybe there's an option for uh, expanding our offerings. Um, there's just a lot of excitement. Uh, and I think while we can't do everything all at once, like I would like to, um, I'm excited to see what you guys have considered and, and how we can move forward. Perfect. So, no, okay. Um, I think that we have one. Can I add probably. one more thing then? Can you, Luke, in your research, he mentioned pickle, what's it called, pickleball? Um, I know that we had a conversation of the reason why we don't have pickleball lines, and um, can you just confirm? And so then it's not a repeated conversation again and again and again. 
Well, for next month, right? Correct. Okay. All right. Well, you can Perfect. answer it now if you want, but it's up to you. Oh, it's 9.15. Well, um, I can, uh, I mean, as I get, if we're going to talk about capital expenditures, it might make sense to just do that all as part of the what it costs to do the different um, types of work on the tennis courts. We'd be happy to, to speak on that more in depth um, next time around. Sense. That sounds perfect. All right, let's go to the public. One second. Hi. Um, I, I guess I'll, I could start a number of places. First of all, I'm, looks the everything's looking great. I've been over the pool. Uh, Luke and his team have been doing a good good job. Um, I wanted to talk about. Uh, a couple things. First, uh, pickleball. The reason why why pickleball is the fastest growing sport in the country, and it has been for a number of years. The primary it, all people of all ages enjoy the sport, um, and I do think courts three and four, the lower courts, is the ideal location for it. Um, we do not have. Uh, the tennis players don't have exclusive rights to those courts. I think they could share them. The good thing about pickleball players uh, is they tend to be older. They tend to play during the day where tennis court uh, tennis courts are used after school and towards the evenings. So it is fully compatible. Most every other uh, jurisdiction in uh, Marin County has pickleball uh, as part of their uh, programs on courts. So, uh, you know, what gives? Why are we giving exclusive access uh, to uh, the professional tennis players? Um, I, uh, this, these courts belong to the community and they should serve the community. Um, uh, unfortunately, uh, when talking with the fire chief uh, regarding the work plan, I didn't actually get the answer I was looking for. He gave me a lot of detail. I really wanted to talk about the process, the process of a work plan. And I think that's what's missing in our parks. We don't have a yearly work plan. We don't have longer term objectives. We don't have standards of care in our park. And I will give... Uh, a recent example um, where we're um, doing landscaping work by uh, bucket loader uh, to remove uh, uh, bushes and it looks absolutely terrible and there is a, a right way to do that. We need professional management of our open spaces and our parks and unfortunately we don't have the staff resources to do it but we can with the will. That's all I have to say. Thank you, Stephen. All right. Um, so moving on to each board members of items of interest requests for future agenda. I think we have a bunch of things that we've requested. Does anybody have anything else? Okay. Um, is there a mo I guess the date of our next regular board meeting is June 14th. And at 7.30, be here, be square, and not the same square, sorry. Um, do I have a motion to adjourn? So or did moved. I miss something? Oh, wait, no, public comment on items of interest for next time. Sorry, I was too quick on the draw. I liked my little comments about being square and forgot about the public comment, sorry. It's really more of a rectangle on the screen. Oh, thank you, Bill. <laughs> Go ahead, Stephen. Uh, you did a great job tonight, Savan. Uh, so th thank you very much for conducting a great meeting. Um, there was one other thing that I wanted to bring up. I, and I guess we can talk about it at a future meeting. If you look at the maintenance area, one of the, the issues that I have with our maintenance team is their lack of organizational discipline. I don't mean management, I mean organizing the stuff that they have. And if you, you'll see, they've started to expand outside their gates. We can be tolerant during this transition period, but it, I, if you look inside the gates, you'll see it's pretty messy in there. 
And that's why the reason why they have required so much space, because they do not have organizational discipline of their work areas and uh, storage. And, um, you know, why do we have a rack just outside the gate? Well, I guess it's the only place that they could put it. But honestly, um, we need policies um, in place for our landscaping crews. They serve the park. They are not the, we shouldn't be working around their needs. They should be working around our needs. And um, we want to give them adequate space, but no more because the park belongs to the people. So hopefully that will be something that comes up in the future. Um, and also I would lastly like to say, and this is kind of an aside, they say you can get more with honey than vinegar. Uh, or, and I actually have some hives in my backyard. And if any of you are interested in Marin Wood, Quiet Wood Drive honey, I'd be happy to bring you over a jar. Uh, you can respond after this if you're interested. I promise not to poison any of them. Okay, so that's it. I will talk to you. Thank you, Stephen, and for your kind offer about honey <laughs> and for agreeing not to poison us, which I'm sure you wouldn't do, even if you agreed not to do it. Um, we love the discussions with you. So, all right. Um, do we have a motion to adjourn? Motion, motion to, to adjourn. adjourn. I get nope. Nope. I got it first. <laughs> yeah, I got it first. Do you want to second it, Chris? Uh -oh. No. Second. <laughs> are you okay with this feedback <laughs> tiffany oh yeah i'm writing it all down okay yep. the thumbs up the double thumbs up okay. good job beth <laughs> kidding all right i think that we're all silly tired and we will see everybody next month wait have oh. a great weekend yes everybody have a great and we have to vote yeah vote on a journey you don't know oh I good think we needed to vote on a journey i'm like no you're good thank Bye, you everybody. guys thank you everybody stay safe everybody and COVID next free. month bye, bye. Hey.